There's a, a popular business book that was written by Stephen Covey. It's called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. It made him a lot of money, I think. The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Pre- pretty good common horse sense in the book. But the second habit of highly effective people, he wrote in his book, is this. Begin with the end in mind. Begin with the end in mind, which just sounds entirely Christian and biblical. That truth is all over the Bible. Begin with the end in mind. When I came here and I was privileged to be called to pastor this wonderful church, one of the things that just was bursting in my heart was my beginning here. Begin with the end in mind. In your leadership, always think forward to the end, the end that God says should be the end, and then kind of reverse engineer the church to accomplish what God says the church is supposed to accomplish. And the end is, and even in the book of Matthew, we're in a series of messages taken from the first of the five discourses of Jesus recorded in Matthew, and it's famously called the Sermon on the Mount. And in this series of messages, we're kind of flying high over the message, and we're, we're kind of cherry-picking the 14 things that Jesus' people are. What are Jesus' people like? They are like this, they're like this, they're like this. 14 different qualities of Jesus' people. What we're doing is we're beginning with the end in mind. In other words, why are we here and what are we doing? We're here to follow Jesus. We're making disciples. And this is based on what it says at the very end of this Gospel of Matthew. If you recall, here's how the Gospel of Matthew ends. Jesus, in a post-resurrection appearance, is meeting probably with hundreds of his disciples. And he says to them, all authority is given to me in heaven and on earth he says all authority is given to me in heaven no man could say that only the god man jesus all authority in matthew and chapter 5 he begins the sermon on the mount and he says you have heard in this section we're going to talk about today he's going to say six times you have heard it was said by them of old etc but i say to you and then in Matthew 7, 29, the last verse in the Sermon on the Mount, the people respond to the Sermon on the Mount by saying, he teaches like one who has authority and not like the scribes and Pharisees. The scribes and Pharisees were doing their actually distortion of the Old Testament law, but they were claiming other authorities. They didn't claim themselves as final authorities, but when Jesus spoke, everybody knew he was speaking as if he was the final authority. He spoke like one with authority. So he gets to the end of the book, and he says to his disciples that are gathered there in the post-resurrection appearance, all authority is given to me. Now I want you to go into all the world and what? Make disciples. What's next? You guys need to get this right. I'm a little disappointed. I love you, but I'm a little disappointed. (laughs) So I'm going to go over this again, and you will never get it wrong again, okay? This is kind of important. This man was dead, was tortured, crucified, buried, and rose again. And he met with his disciples, and we want to say what he said. All authority is given me in heaven and earth. Go, therefore, make disciples. Yeah, come on now. Baptizing them. Yeah, yeah, and all of that too. So, so, and, and so yeah, the, the chunks are, you know, f- um, make disciples, learners, baptize them, teach them to observe all my commands. That's the end that we ought to have in mind at Bethel. That's all that it's all, that's what it's all about. Beginning with the end in mind, are we disciples who make disciples? Are we following Jesus and are we helping other people follow Jesus? That's all that it's about. And that's beautiful. That's a beautiful thing. When you read just the way Jesus talked about Jesus' people in Matthew chapter 5, you understand what Jesus said in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 in the Sermon on the Mount has been stirring the hearts of human beings 
since he said it, it changed the world. His powerful teaching in the Sermon on the Mount transformed the world. The world, we know it is different because of the brilliant things that Jesus said in this. And what he's saying is that we're not just saved to avoid hell and go to heaven, but when we're saved, that is true that we avoid hell and go to heaven. But if you read the Sermon on the Mount, you can tell that the character of Christ followers is transformed. They become different people. He opens the kingdom of heaven, and when we step into the kingdom, you know, when we press into the kingdom of heaven through repentance, then our very character and our very nature is changed, and we're transformed to be Jesus' people. How would you like to have a portrait of that? That's what we have in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. So one of the things that you see in this is the authority of Jesus. He has every right to command his creatures and his redeemed ones, for whom he died, who believed in him and followed him, he has every right to expect of them this kind of life, the Jesus people life. And he works, and you know, to get the whole story in the Bible, you know that he works in, a, in, in, in sanctifying process through the work of the Holy Spirit to bring all those who know him and who are possessed by the Holy Spirit into that, gradually into that likeness of Jesus. That's your destiny you, if you really are a believer, you will eventually be Christ-like. Some of you are moving really slow, but you're moving. Your pastor is moving really slow. He's had so many privileges. He should be so much farther down the road than he is, but it's like this, like the big hand on the clock. You can't see it, but he's moving, and so we want to say, okay, God, I believe you. I believe that you have every right to demand this kind of living, and I believe that you have the power to produce this kind of living in me, that's kind of exciting. Begin with the end in mind, and the end is make disciples. Now let's back up, and that's why we have that wheel, it's not on the wall right now, the Bethel wheel is a description of how the leaders in the church, the elders, have come to believe that we're pursuing how we help people move around that wheel to becoming followers of Jesus who, who also help others follow Jesus. That come, grow, serve wheel. There's so much more to that than might meet the eye. That's the idea. We're just trying to follow Jesus and help you follow Jesus because there's nothing any better in the world than that. And what does that look like when a group of people, I mean, imagine a people who took the teaching of Jesus very seriously. Imagine a people who took the authority of Jesus with, with dead earnest seriousness. Imagine a place where you could go where all the people who covenanted together to be a part of that group, they covenanted together to be a part of that group saying, we're the Jesus people. We do what Jesus says. We love Jesus. We can hold one another accountable to what Jesus commanded we believe that God works in us to make us the kind of people that are described in this beautiful discourse of Jesus in the outdoors that he gave. What about a, a place like that? Imagine a place like that. Imagine a people like that who really do take Jesus seriously. So last week we got the first two. We have 14 all together. Let's look now in our Bibles in Matthew chapter 5. And the text uh, today is going to begin in verse 21. Now, there's, uh, so this is a sermon. I believe it's a single sermon, although I believe that Jesus taught this over and over again in different ways. I believe that we don't have a collection of sayings of Jesus here. I believe that we have a sermon. And you see the symmetry, the beautiful, you know, Jesus was not an ignorant peasant. He, he's very God, a very God with the keenest mind anyone ever possessed. His sermons are the best sermons that were ever preached, right? It's Jesus we're talking about here. So not only does he have authority, but he has the beauty and order and symmetry and depth. There's more to this than any of us will ever plumb the depths of it in all of our life. But notice the structure is interesting. I believe that he gives a synopsis in the Beatitudes about what, that, what Jesus people look like in, in a kind of a high flyover, what they're not and what they are. And he gives that in, these beat, in this gorgeous, poetic Beatitudes that people have cherished all these years. 
And then he gives two, so he gives those, and he gives the two similitudes. You're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. And now in this section, it's very, very clear. There's a structure to it. It's a very clear structure. It's, it's impossible to miss. He says the same thing six times. Loosely, they're about the second table of the law. You know what, you, what I mean when I use this term, the second table of the law? When you think of the Ten Commandments, I, by the way, how many of you have memorized the Ten Commandments? Raise your hand if you've memorized the Ten Commandments. Raise your hand. Okay, now come up here. No, 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 I'm just kidding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You remember, okay, let's do it again. How many of you, you know the Ten Commandments? I could ask you any one of them and you'd be able to tell me what they are. Okay, 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 that's, that's good. That's, I mean, that's bad. All right, now, um, so, but I'm your pastor, so it's my fault. Okay, so um, how many of you, I'm just going to have a vote here because that's how we roll. Um, how many of you, if I took 20 minutes, we won't do this right now, if I took 20 minutes and took you through a childlike series of like motions, stories and motions and silly behaviors, all right? Not everybody likes this, but if I took you, if I took 20 minutes to teach you the, the Ten Commandments, and I guarantee you, you would never forget them in or out of order. How many of you would be willing to be silly to learn that? Raise your hand. Okay, put your hands down. How many of you would say, I do not want to ever be silly in church? Raise your hand. Okay, because I, some of you, yeah, okay, I get it. Uh, sure, you surprise me with the sense of humor you have. I, I'm really actually surprised about that. I just don't even believe it. Anyway, I could do this. Uh, uh, but, but okay, so, so think of the Ten Commandments, you know, and you have, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make any grievance images. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. These are God words, the first table of the law, God word commands. But then you have like commands that have to do with human relationships. Honor your father and mother. Don't kill. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't covet. Don't lie. I missed one. Don't lie. And they're all kind of relating to relationships with people. Now, what Jesus, I believe, is doing is he is not pushing back against the Ten Commandments. He wouldn't do that, and he makes that very clear in verse 17 when he says, you know, the least in the kingdom is the one who softens the law, and the greatest in the kingdom is the one who teaches the law. The problem is not with the law. It's what people do with the law, and it's still that way today. The problem is not with the law of God. The law of God is perfect. Converting the soul, testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise and simple, statue of the Lord are right, rejoice in the heart. The law is good. And, and people who love God love the law of God, and they want to obey the law of God. And in the power of the Holy Spirit, they can obey the law of God progressively. So the law isn't bad. And Jesus, when he teaches, he says, you, six times in this, he says, you've heard it was said by them of old, but I say to you. He's not saying, Moses said this, but I'm telling you this. That's not what he's saying. He's saying the, 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 you, you, those who have distorted the law, that he's primarily the scribes and Pharisees, who he names in chapter 5 and verse 20. He's saying there, those that have taken the law and they distorted the use of it, taken away from it or added to it or distorted the use of it for a different purpose or made it a means of salvation or something else, that's incorrect. This is how you look at the law. This is how you look at what God says. And, it, and primarily, he aims these six different things at the second table of the law. They're, real, they're about human relationships. So it's very interesting that when Jesus teaches this, he's, he's assuming the love for God, and he's going after how do you tell when you have a Jesus person? It's how they treat other people. And then immediately somebody says, well, I'm good because I ain't never killed anybody, right? I'm good. I never killed anybody. And he says, well, let's take a look at that. So there you are in Matthew 5, 21. And over again, over, over again he's going to give six contrasts. In verses 21 through 26, he gives a contrast here. You've heard it was said, don't commit murder. There's a contrast about that you've heard in verse 27 about lust. You've heard, don't commit adultery, but I say to you. In verse 33 about oaths, you've heard it was said to those of old, you should not swear falsely and so forth, but I say to you. There's that about retaliation. In verse 38, you have heard that it was said an eye for an eye, but I say to you. The fifth one is about loving your enemies. You have heard that it was said you should love your neighbor but I say to you, so forth. So, so, you, so you have in, in this the, 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 the Lord's teaching that Jesus' people are different in the way they regard other people. In chapter uh, 5, verse 21, 
You've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. Whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you, everyone who's angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. So you say murder is a sin. Jesus says, yes, but what's behind murder is anger, and unrighteous anger is, is a sin. But I say to you, everyone who's angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. And then he goes beyond that and says, whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. I don't want you to kill people. I don't want you to be sinfully angry. I don't want you to talk mean about people. What do we have here? Jesus' people are kind and forgiving in their conduct and in their speech, and they have special respect for other human beings. It goes beyond just not killing people. It goes beyond, it's, it, goes, it, goes, it touches every part of a place where you might have contempt for some other human being. It would be, wouldn't this include if, it, if you say, if, you, if, if Jesus doesn't, if Jesus says you're violating the law and you're sinning enough to go to hell if you say you fool, that's kind of serious. He actually says that next. See what it says? And I remember as a child when I was first taught this, it was really quite sobering to me. Whoever said, then, uh, whoever says you fool, so there you have murder, and we agree, oh yeah, murder is sin. Then verse 22, anger is sin. Then later on in verse 22, insulting people is enough sin to be answerable to God. And then finally, it's if you say you fool. And whoever says you fool will be liable to the fire of hell, to the hell fire. Well, that sounds serious. And then, and then he goes on and says, so if you're offering your gift on the altar and there you remember your brother has something against you, leave your gift before the altar and go and be reconciled to your brother. Then come off your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you to the judge, the judge or the guard, and you're put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you've paid every penny. So every time he uses one of these contrasts, he ends in a very sobering warning. And what he's saying is this, don't reduce what I said to, okay, you haven't murdered anybody, so you're guiltless. No, I want you to have such a high regard for human beings that you don't talk mean to them, that you don't call them you fool, that you don't cut them off in traffic, that you don't disregard them, that you don't treat human beings with contempt. Listen to a podcast this week of a guy, this is going to be crazy, so you know, buckle your seatbelt. And he was raised in the home of lesbian mothers, and, and his, so his mom left his dad, and his dad went into a, a homosexual relationship, and his mom went into a homosexual relationship, and this is the way he was raised. And his parents, all of them, said to him, Christians are hateful. Christians are hateful. They hate us because of what we do. Christians hate us. He grew up Interestingly enough, he would go to, of course, gay pride rallies, and he there would meet people who claimed to be Christians who really were very hateful. And so it was confirmed, you know, Christians are the people who hate us. And then later on, he met others who gave him the gospel. He was converted. He became a pastor. He went to Dallas Seminary. The story ends cool. He leads his parents to the Lord. You can listen to it. It's an amazing story. Today, he, gets, he helps consult churches. One of the things he says to people is, people that are in any kind of sin should be treated with the highest regard as creations of God, no matter what kind of sin they're involved in. They should not be treated with contempt. Jesus' people don't treat anybody else with contempt because they realize they answer to God because they realize people are precious to God, so they should be precious to us, right? Because they realize they answer to God someday, because they realize those people are made in the image of God, and all of God's friends were once his enemies. Am I right? All of God's friends were made friends because of his overpowering love. So it's good for the church to hear that again. We're the people who are the Jesus followers who do not show contempt to other human beings, but we treat all other human beings with a sacred regard, no matter how troubled they might be or what they've been through. Do you take that seriously? Is that serious to you? Can you really call yourself a Christian and disregard that? 
You say, well, I believe and I prayed and I signed the card. But, but yes, but, but do you treat people with disregard? Can you really call yourself, are you really Christian? Are, are you really Christian? I heard once about a fellow who said, and I'll get off this subject, but he, he, it's a true story. He said when he was in junior high, there was a boy that was a homosexual in his class. And, and when the boy would go in the locker room and change clothes, the other kids would mock him, you know. And, and, and he said he was, he was and he, he participated in that mocking, this boy named Roger. They said one day this, this boy, he was confused, this troubled boy, the boys knocked him down in the shower and they urinated on him. The guy said the next day he hung himself. And the guy said that was the day that I realized I was not a Christian. Before we get any farther, we might want to stop and say, you know, I know I prayed the prayer and walked the aisle and all that, but am I a Christian? Are you a Christian? If you couldn't talk and we could just watch your life, or maybe we could listen to the private things that you say about people that you have contempt for, would we know you were a Christian? Do you have the heart of Jesus toward broken people who are different than you? Are you really Christian? Imagine a people that were really Christian. Imagine a place where people gathered that, that really did believe the truth, but they also really loved people who are broken and who also recognized they too are broken beyond repair. If it wasn't for what Jesus did, all of us are broken beyond repair in different ways. We don't have a special category for people that we show disgust for. That's not what Jesus did. When Jesus came in the room, he came in the room looking for the worst case. When Jesus came in the room, he came in the room looking for the person who needed to be healed. He came in the room looking for the person who would be, how bad would it be to be demonized, to be demon-possessed? Jesus came looking for demon-possessed people. I would say that's a bad category, demon-possessed. I mean, I met some people. I wonder sometimes, you know. About some of you. No, I'm just kidding. I was a joke. I was just kidding around. But, you know, if you ever met a person, you go, like, oh, wow. This person, like, okay, that's the person Jesus came in a room looking for. He wasn't working the crowd with his business card trying to get support for his cause. He wasn't. He was walking in the room looking for people that are sad, that are broken, that are, that are guilty, that are hopeless. That's what Jesus, that's why we love him. Because one day he came in a room and he found us. And we were going to hell. And we deserved it. And he said, I want you. And he, took, and he made us a part of his family. I got, Lois got sick the other day. She's okay today. But we went to the emergency room. I don't know how you work in healthcare. It just hurts so bad to see people. I mean, I don't want to be too direct, but like here's a lady just, you know, sick to her stomach. Here's a little boy with his arm broken or disfigured. There's people that are just hurting. I just thought, I wish I could be like Jesus who walk in here to heal everybody. You know, it's just so sad to see everybody so hurting. Can I just tell you this about Jesus? Why do we love him? Because, because he walks in a room of hurting people and he loves them every one. And he has the highest regard for them. And you, don't you dare call yourself a follower of Jesus and look down on other people that he created and loves. You're really, you got a twisted mind. You're confused. You got blinders on. You need to bury yourself in the teaching of Jesus until you see it. Jesus' people are people who are kind and forgiving in their conduct and speech. You've got to take that seriously. I was privileged as a boy to have a, a mother who did not let me off the hook. I was, it was Francis Street in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I would think I was in first grade for the second time. They loved me in first grade, so they had me <laughs> do it twice. They just said, we can't imagine life without Kenny for another year. Let's just have him here again. It was like that. <laughs> My dad was in Vietnam. My mom was pregnant with my brother Kevin. We were having family devotions. I was looking out through the glass, and my mom was just reading this passage. And she said, if you say you fool, you're in danger of hellfire. And my head shot up because I had called my sister a fool. She wasn't, but I said that. And I remember this like it was yesterday. 
1965. I'm like, wait, mom, mom, I literally, mom, can you say that again? <laughs> she, she looks at and she does not let me, my mom is sharp, does not let me off the hook, doesn't even smile. No warmth at all. She's like in prophet mode. <laughs> she just looks over there and she just reads it again, like, you know, weight of the word on my heart. I'm like, help me with this, Mom. Because if what he just said is true, I'm in danger of hell fire. Because I said that. Is it true? Is saying you fool to somebody a big enough sin to go to hell? Huh? You don't think so? Talk to Jesus. He's the one who said it. <laughs> like, he said, if you, you, if you disregard somebody and you call them a name or you call them a fool, that's enough of a sin. That breaks my heart. That's enough of a sin for you to go to hell. Then my mother finally took me to the cross, showed me how I could be forgiven for such a grievous sin against God. So as a little boy, I learned to cling to the gospel because I had been thoroughly taught the law at my mother's knee, right? If you haven't had that experience, I hope you're having it right now. Because you'll never be Jesus' people until you realize he had the highest regard for human beings. He sends the rain, the blessing of his precious rain, on the just and on the unjust alike. That's just what he's like. He wants you to be like him. You love people that don't love him? He wants you to. As you can imagine, I could go on and on about that. Let's look at the next one. This is number four. Jesus' people are pure in their behavior and their talk, and they're even pure in their secret thought life. Verse 27, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, everyone who looks on a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. This goes for girls too, by the way. You know that, right? If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one of your members than your whole body to be thrown in hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off, throw it away. It's better that you lose one of your members than your whole body go to hell. There he is about hell again. Maybe some of us can imagine if we have not committed adultery that that would be a sin so grievous a person would be deserving of hell. But that secret thought that's An ungoverned, secret, immoral thought is enough of a sin to send us to hell? That's what Jesus is teaching. I heard once a man say that when you're trying to help people with this area of following Jesus by having a really pure heart, pure life, pure thought life, that a good thing to ask them is to say to them, there are three battlefields that we fight on morally. One is the battlefield of our habits. The other is the battlefield of our actions. And the other is the battlefield of our thoughts. And he says, ask them, how many battlefields are you fighting on? What Jesus is saying is, is this. Don't just say, I'm safe because I have never committed adultery. But this is heaven and hell serious. Watch over your secret heart. Okay, this is true about me. I'm just going to tell you, and then I'm going to get off talking about me here. I have a temptation every once in a while to think, if I allow myself to have a secret thought that's not pure, who's going to know? And it goes through my mind. It's a lie that goes through my mind every once in a while. Who's going to know? And then I remember this passage. Jesus said, no. It's like he says, Ken, I love you. And I don't ever want you to break your promises to Lois. And I want you in your life and your secret thought life to be pure. And, and if you allow yourself to think like that, it's almost like you douse yourself with gasoline and hope nobody ever strikes a match of opportunity. That's what Jesus is saying. 
Jesus is saying, take it all the way down to the secret thought life. Anybody in the house not convicted right now? Anybody in the house never have a stray thought in some way, a thought of anger or, or lust or greed or selfishness? Well, let's, let's be serious. Of course, you, of course you do. And this is what Jesus is saying. This is dead serious. He says, I have authority, and this is serious. And that is, you want to dial down to the secret thought life and the simplest word. And, and you know, this is not bondage. He's saying, I through the work of the Holy Spirit, can help you be this kind of person that you're characterized by this. Jesus' people are pure. And now it it gets even harder, and I approach this next one with, with, I've just trembled about this all week long. Uh, It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let her, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you, Everyone who divorces his wife except on the ground of sexual immorality makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Now, here, here, here's a couple of things that give me caution as I approach the teaching of this, and that one of them is, let's put it in this order, let's talk human, and then let's talk divine. Like, all of us have been touched by divorce, no exceptions. All of us. And when you're touched by divorce, it's like other stuff in a fallen world. It's like, a, it's like an open wound. And I've learned over the 40 years of pastoral ministry that the minute you start to talk about that, people who have an open wound there, they find it very hard to hear. It's very painful for them. And the evil one moves in and he tries to condemn and hurt them. You know? so, so I move with caution. I mean, I've been there. I've been there when the very dearest of me in the world made holy vows before God that they would cherish one another forever. And I've been there in the courtroom when that came to an end. And I've laid in bed with the children of that marriage and tried to help them understand what happened. Nobody here should ever say that isn't sad and and heartbreaking. And Jesus didn't want people to go through that. He wanted us to ideally to keep our promises to one another. And, and so I, I'm cautious because I know that I love you and I know that you love me and I know that all of us are touched and all of us in a way kind of have an open wound and the minute that we talk about it, it's like, a, but here's another thing. Jesus said this stuff. Jesus Christ, the king of the universe, we have no, what does the Bible say? If I soften this teaching, verse 19, therefore whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do, the same will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. So we can't relax what Jesus said, but it helps to fly over this like we're doing it because we see the context. Is Jesus here teaching an exhaustive list of all the teaching about divorce and remarriage in the Bible, yes or no? No, of course he's not. Clearly he's not. He's not giving an exhaustive list on anything. He's the highlight of all of it, the one theme that goes through all of it is we treat one another with a special holy regard if we really are Jesus people. And therefore, we keep our promises. We do what we said. We treat people with special regard and love. When we do sin against people, it's not the end of the world, but it is devastating and we need to make it right. So let me just say this to you, and that is this. We've all been touched by divorce. If you divorced your mate and you broke God's law, you must confess it as sin and make that right as right as you can make it. And God will forgive you, and God will restore you, and there are people in the house that can help you that have been through that, and God's favor and his blessing can be on your life again. But if you have violated this, and you just excuse it, then you are are not following Jesus. Because Jesus' people may be touched by divorce, but if they initiated it in an unbiblical way, they confess it as sin and make it right. For many of you, you've been touched by divorce. It was, it was something you didn't seek. It's something that you didn't want. Or people that you love, something they didn't seek and didn't want. And you acknowledge how painful that is. That's not a sin on your part. 
the very purpose of Jesus putting this here, if you look carefully in the context, is don't just say you can divorce your wife, give her a certificate of divorce. You still show disregard for her. She's still vulnerable. You still make her in a position where it would be easy for her to commit adultery. That's what it says. That's why he's saying it in the context of the rest of what he's saying. That's why he's saying it. Does this make sense? He's saying in every part of your life, show high regard for human beings or you're not a Jesus follower. In, don't cut people off in traffic. Don't call people names. He didn't say that. It's an application. Don't, don't call people names. Don't say you fool. Don't, don't, don't do the, the bare minimum when it comes to your wedding vows. There was a man named Charlie Franks, and he came to visit because his, he, was, he divorced his wife when they were younger, and he just decided, I think, to go out and do wrong. He just divorced his wife, and he left her, and he left the girls, uh, and then they grew up, and now the, the, the former wife and the, and the older daughters were in our church, but then the grandkids were involved in things, so Charlie would come when, he, when the grandkids were involved, and he would watch the grandkids, and he would sit up in a balcony, and I was preaching, and I came across a text that I need to be faithful, and I taught about divorce, and I said, if you divorce your wife, and you broke God's law, you need to ask her to forgive you, and you need to make it right, as right as you can. And a lot of times what people do when you say that is, what do you think they do? They get mad and they don't come back. But that's not what Charlie did. Charlie got saved. Charlie went to his former wife and his daughters, and he asked their forgiveness. I will remember the rest of my life the day that Charlie Franks was baptized. And, and he had a clear eye and he had joy you know, in his life. And that's the way it'll be for you too when you, when you just agree with God about what he said. He wants us. And then, and then there's a final thing. Again, you've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but perform to the Lord what I've sworn. And again, this is about people. It's like you're, you're talking to people and you're, and you're playing a game with them. You're like, it's a little bit like on the, I, I promise, but my fingers were crossed. It doesn't really count. You know, that, that's the idea here. And this is, again, this is a flyover, but that's, that's, that's an accurate way of saying it. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is the footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Do not take an oath by your head. You cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more comes from evil. The Jesus people are, are kind and forgiving in their context and speech. They have special regard for human beings, and they're pure in their behavior and talk, even their secret thought life. They're true, they're mates. And finally, Jesus' people keep their word. Jesus' people do what they said. Years ago, it was interesting, we have a, a friend here, Jack Berry, who's visiting today. So like years ago, we, we were privileged to start a little church. And, and one day, I was out on a Sunday afternoon, and I saw this little boy when I was pumping gas, I made a conversation with him, and it was Jack's oldest son. And they started coming to our church, and Jack became an elder at this church. So Jack, who's here today, was an elder at the church that we started there in Ohio. And it was a small church, and they paid me all they could, which wasn't a lot. And they also gave me the freedom to work outside if I needed to a little bit. We lived in a home that we rented, and the way that we, we had a long-term lease on a home, and the fella died and his widow needed to sell the house so we released her from the lease and we moved to another house that was on the market for sale and we promised the guy who owned it that if it sold we'd move and it sold but it but it sold right when our son Wesley was born so he's just a few days old now here we were we didn't have any place to go we had a newborn baby we were in the worst of circumstances and we were supposed to move and I promised him that I would move my, my, my uh, closest advisors said, you don't have to move right away. You know, you have legal means that you can string it out and whatever. It was the 15th of the month, I remember, because I got up and I took my Bible and I opened up to Psalm 15, and that's that, who will ascend unto the hill of the Lord. And one of the things it said is, he who swears to his own hurt and changes not. And I felt like the Lord told me, do what you said. You said you'd move in 30 days, move. Some Amish people found an old, like, deer cabin for us to move into, and we moved out in this place called Wahonding, in this dump of a place. So while we were there, we didn't want to stay in that house much. We went and visited my brother-in-law in Michigan. While I was visiting my brother-in-law in Michigan, he asked me to preach for him. 
when I preached for him, there were two ladies in the church that came forward and said, would you be willing to come and pastor our church? We, we need a new pastor, and we'd like you to consider doing that. And long story short, because of the hardship, because of the difficulty, and because of keeping our word, God guided our lives into our next place of ministry, which they happened to have a gorgeous five-bedroom parsonage with a fireplace. <laughs> that was cool. They did. Hannah, you remember that? So we're, we're driving up there, and I joked around. I said, Hannah, I said to the kids, I said, um, if, it's, if the parsonage has a fireplace, it's God's will for us to go there. <laughs> you don't remember that? You're just like your mother. You never confirm my stories. You just like sit over there like. <laughs> so we, we walk into the parsonage, and we're looking, and I feel little Hannah tug on my sleeve. Dad, 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 look. And there's a beautiful fireplace. He who swears to his own hurt and changes not. This is what Jesus' people do. They say things, and they do them. And if they don't do them, they ask for forgiveness. And they get back on the Jesus train. That's what Jesus' people do. 